The Rebel Capitalist Show. I'd like to remind everyone that when the Fed came out and announced that they were basically going to buy junk debt in March of 2020, uh, the, the market just screamed higher as far as the prices of junk debt, the yield went down significantly. And I was talking to Joseph Wang about this, and he said, you know, what's fascinating is the Fed only bought about a billion dollars worth of junk debt through that special purpose vehicle. But the fact that they just bought a small amount uh, implied to the market that they were going to backstop everything. So the market did the rest of the work for the Fed. So do you think they could pull the same type of trick buying equities directly and they would maybe only have to buy a very, very small amount, but just that what that means implicitly would uh, psychologically prompt the market to just have an infinite bid on stocks for, 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 for the next, you know, however, however long until the, the market drives higher. Yeah, the press releases are shock and awe. Yeah, but we right. we don't we don't really know all the stuff the Fed has bought because we're not doing independent audits. Ron Paul got a one time partial audit. It was literally worse than a root canal. It was a nightmare trying to get a one time partial audit. Well, no, I know I've I've done it with with Barnes. I mean, we sent in that FOIA request probably three months ago. Their deadline was February, and they still have not got back to us on our FOIA request. So I get it. You're preaching to the choir. And Ron Paul had more access to the Fed chairman. Ron Paul probably got some people. Um, he he got John McCain and I think Bernie Sanders on board at the same time. I mean that. I think yeah, because he got both. He had to get both houses of Congress to agree to the bill. So that was the one time he's in. He got um, radical Republicans and Democrats to actually agree to audit the Fed to look what the Fed was actually buying in two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Who knows what's off balance sheet with the Fed. These currency swap lines, and I was speaking with hedge fund managers last week, you have European banks now that made enormous amounts of loans to Russian private companies, and you have all the problems in the Russian economy. So these European banks could all have enormous counterparty risks. They could have big defaults on loans, and the European Central Bank has an ironclad emergency currency swap line contract with the Federal Reserve Bank. So if the European Central Bank needs trillions in emergency dollar loans, yeah. the Federal Reserve Bank has to credit their account. Mm. There's no vote with Congress. The citizens don't get to see this. The Federal Reserve Bank is under contract. There was a disclosure about this that was covered in a speech that the Gold Antitrust Action Committee, it was posted on the Bank of International Settlements website, a former New York Federal Reserve Bank higher up gave a speech talking about this uh, at a Bank of International Settlements uh, event gala. It was a party or something. And then Gold Antitrust Action Committee was the only one that covered this, talking about emergency currency swap agreements between these um, G7, between the Federal Reserve Bank, the Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England. Those are really the four or five largest central banks where these currency emergency currency swap line agreements take place. So we don't know what the real amount is. Right. But but what you're saying there is the ECB does have some firepower to potentially bail out uh, the European banks if there's some systemic risks with those banks not being paid back by Russian creditors. Exactly. And they might not even they might not even announce it publicly, though. So they would probably only announce it publicly if the shares of these European banks started to absolutely collapse then you would start to see press releases from the European Central Bank saying the Federal Reserve Bank has extended emergency currency swap lines, the banks are going to get emergency funding, the loans are going to be paid back, but bing, bang, boom, six months, a year later, the loans are magically waived. Yeah, right, right, right. So this is, this is what happens in a fiat. There is, is there's a lot, we just see the tip of the iceberg with uh, the Fed's balance sheet, but there's a lot that's going on underneath the surface. Uh, that we can't see that could lead to some of the prices we're seeing in other things, such as the stock market, or uh, you know, who, who knows, the, the European bond market, or uh, corporate let me, debt in Europe or something. Let me recommend a book. So um, I don't agree with her politics, but I am friends with her, Nomi Prince. She was a former managing director at Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, and Bear Stearns. 
And she wrote a book a couple of years ago called Collusion Between the Central Bankers. And she actually flew down to Mexico and Brazil and interviewed central bankers, current and former. They spoke about the amount of bailouts, the real amounts of bailouts in 2008 and how Ben Bernanke was forcing a lot of these other central bankers in other countries to take the dollar so their own economy did not collapse. So they were taking emergency loans. He was threatening them. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, this, it's just, it, it makes it hard to decipher what is real, what's just noise and, and what you should actually pay attention to, to try to predict the probabilities of X, Y, Z happening in the future. I mean, how, maybe that's the best question, Jason. How, how do you do that? How do you sift through all the noise? How, how do you try to get to the bottom and, and, and find the truth uh, in not just the media propaganda, uh, but uh, you know, what's happening underneath the surface with all of these transactions that are happening in, in the shadows in the financial system? Well, as an investor, it's different than trying to find out what's happening with the Fed behind the scenes, because that might not move the markets immediately. Mm -hmm. So as an investor, what I'm looking for is I follow Sir John Templeton's investing philosophy. So I'm looking for top down, bottom up. I'm doing global macro. And then I'm looking at sectors and companies, sectors that are hated, companies that have better fundamentals in a bad sector. So with, so with oil back in 2020, when oil was hated. And in two years, George, we've gone from negative oil prices, oil prices yeah. low, cheap gasoline yeah. prices, in only two years now, record high gasoline prices. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's an incredible swing in only two years. Shows how crazy everything is and how fragile the oil industry is. But at the time, I was looking for cheap oil companies that had good balance sheets that were low-cost producers to survive. For uranium, I was looking at companies like Cameco that could still make some revenue at a low uranium price. So yeah, they didn't have their two best minds running, but they were still acting like a hedge fund. They were going into the they were going into the spot market in uranium like a hedge fund trader, buying cheap spot uranium for years and then flipping it at a long-term contract price to utilities. And that's what Cameco had to do to survive. That stock was at $8 not to I think like 2 years ago and now it's at 20 something. Hmm. So as an investor, it's it's a little different than actually like looking at all the crazy stuff the Fed's doing because the Fed, a lot of the stuff's not going to end up being true because a lot of the Fed stuff is propaganda, spin, lies. I mean, they issue press releases guaranteeing trillions in liquidity programs. And you said the reality, the reality is they hardly spent anything. But look, Wall Street loved what the Fed did because the Wall Street investment banks get to manufacture more of these credit derivatives and junk bonds and other stuff, they get the, the, the junk bond salespeople get to get enormous commissions, bonuses, um, they get raises, uh, they get salary raises, they get promotions at work by selling more junk bonds, by selling more credit derivatives to pension funds, to suckers. But yeah. without the Fed issuing the press releases saying that they were going to buy and they didn't actually have to buy a lot, none of that would have happened. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, right. So this is how this is how the sausage is made. Wall Street banks love this stuff. They want to sell as many junk bonds and credit derivatives and, and collateralized loan obligations, leveraged loans, all this toxic sausage. And I use toxic sausage because a lot of the time people don't even know what's in it. I mean, look in 2008, these collateralized these CDOs, collateralized debt obligations with the mortgage-backed securities, they were hiring PhD rocket scientists to chop this stuff up. Hmm. So a lot of people in the banks themselves didn't even know what was in a lot of these products. The higher-ups in the bank, they couldn't tell you all the exact stuff. So this is why like the hedge fund managers for the big short, they were looking through the stuff that was in these things and they were absolutely horrified. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. But that just that just goes to show you the, ex the, the complexities of the, the bank's balance sheets and, and how they manage it with, to your point, derivatives. I would also throw in credit default swaps to bring down the perceived risk of the asset side of their balance sheet, while in reality, they're just adding more leverage because those credit default swaps you know, could be uh, off balance sheet or you know, those credit default swap could be an asset or a liability on the bank's balance sheet, pending on, on the price. Well, it, George, 
Mad. The banks don't want to hold the banks don't want to hold a lot of this stuff. It's a game of hot potato or musical chairs. They want to dump, they want to create this stuff, make big commissions and fees selling it. Yeah, right. And they don't want to be caught holding it. Like mortgages. People think that you get a mortgage from B of A or Wells Fargo. They don't realize that they're just <laughs> they're just a middleman. They're just they, they facilitate the transaction and sell the paper to uh Fannie and Freddie before the ink's dry. Well, what happened to this commercial real estate bubble? So there was over trillion, trillions of dollars in commercial real estate mortgage-backed securities. We have the economy under a heavy transition. I see press releases every day about restaurants and bricks and mortar retailers closing, moving things to a warehouse and online for online sales, people working from home. People are not doing as much normal types of eating out and shopping. You would think that this would cause an enormous commercial real estate default across all across Chicago. Um, excuse me, all across the United States. Uh, I just brought up Chicago because I saw a press release about like some premier uh, premier mall, shopping mall in Chicago. And I think it was $500 million a couple of years ago. And I think it just sold for 30 million. So it went down from 500 million down to 30 million. Yeah, and right. you would think that this would cause just wide scale trillions of dollars in commercial real estate default. And the banks were holding these commercial real estate loans and the real estate investment trusts were invested in either owning these commercial real estate buildings or they invested in commercial real estate mortgage-backed securities, the pension funds on them too. Where is the defaults? We, we haven't seen this wide-scale default. I'm just pretty shocked. I, I, my educated guess, and I can't prove it because we don't have a Fed audit, is the Fed went and bought trillions of this stuff and stuffed them off balance sheet already and prevented the banks from having problems again. Right. So they're, so they're not the banks and the pension funds and the hedge funds aren't taking the haircut. The, the Fed is, and they have an infinite balance sheet. So who cares? That would be my educated guess, but there's no way to prove it because there is no real transparency with what the Fed is actually doing now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a great point.